So, welcome back to COM 5 to 6, Efficient Algorithms. Uh, in Unit 2, we'll talk about some fundamental data structures. That will be a recap for all of you who have seen some undergraduate uh, level algorithms and data structures class. Uh, but some of these are just so beautiful, I don't want to not talk about them in case some of you have not seen them. And we'll also build on some of them a little bit later on, so it's, it's worthwhile going through this. I want to point out that this normally fills half a semester or so of lectures if you do this at the normal speed in undergrad courses. So we'll, we'll have to race through this fairly quickly over the course of this and next week. Uh, there's much more information in the, the red book, Algorithms 4th Edition, uh, and, and other books, and there's nice lecture videos on this topic. So if you haven't seen all of this before, I think you, you might um, you might need a little extra time preparing this uh, on your own. And there's, there's ample good resources for that. I don't think you can really uh, grasp that material in the time I presented here if you've never seen it before. I apologize. On the other hand, two thirds of you have seen it before. And so I'll try to not uh, spend too much time on it, but maybe give you a, a few you know, um, perspective and angles that um, are not always taught in undergraduate courses. Uh, you'll, be my, you'll be my judge then. So the learning outcomes for this are, uh, first of all, something that also the, the prerequisite survey touched upon. I want you to have an understanding of what an abstract data type is and what implementations or data structures are. Uh, there's a few really fundamental abstract data types that you just should be able to talk in terms of. That's the computer science vocabulary. Um, we'll look at a few concrete implementations. Um, I think for these that's not so important for now because you will see what these are as we go along. Um, and uh, the hope is that you get the, the gist of how they work. The unit has quite a few different subsections. I'll try to have one video per subsection, so to not make the videos too long. Um, many small sections. But uh, let's get started. It's not long ago, but let's recap the machine model. Pardon? The slides are always on the website. They're not always on the website ages in advance, but I'll, I'll try to be a good boy. I think this one should be on, on the website now, or at least some slightly out, outdated version of it. Uh, so that's, that's a new slide I added because I felt uh, after, after one or two weeks, sometimes this fades. So we're working on the random access machine. However, uh, we'll have to assume a few other things, a little operating system working on this. What the machine can do right away is basic pseudocode, so simple Python constructs will just assume that they have the natural meanings. Uh, then we assume that we can create arrays so contiguous pieces of memory filled with identical sized pieces of data, uh, but only if we know the size in advance. That's the basic assumption that I think all, all memory management systems I know of uh, make. You can ask for a piece of memory if you tell me how big it is, and then usually it's hard to change that size afterwards. You can, you can get a new one if you need more. Um, and a, a twist on that is you can create instances of a class. So if you say, I have a class with several fields, that's essentially saying I need an array to cover all those fields or a contiguous piece of memory to cover those fields. So in a way, the two on a low level look the same, um, but we'll use different pseudocode for convenience. A little caveat here is that Python abstracts some of this away. There are no real arrays in Python, full stop, it just doesn't exist. Um, everything in Python is a list which has uh, a variable size. <clears throat> so you don't have this problem that you have to know the size in advance. Python does this under the hood for you, and we'll talk briefly about how it does that. So uh, what this means for us, we can basically assume we're writing Python code, but when you analyze it, not everything you can write in Python in a single instruction or even a single line uh, takes constant time. Some of the things that Python offers for you as a convenient thing is actually really slow. And that's something to keep in mind 
uh, especially if you're building data structures on top of that. Uh, you, need to, you need to be able to pierce through the abstraction uh, and, uh, and see what's behind to understand how fast or slow it is. Let's start um, with Adam and Eve, with the basics. And um, so that's, that's the first important definition for today. What is an abstract data type, or ADT? That's the thing that uh, occurred in the, in the prior knowledge survey. An abstract data type is a fairly uh, conceptual thing. It's a list of operations which tells you what should happen if you execute these operations, um, but it doesn't tell you much more. It doesn't tell you how fast it is. It doesn't tell you how you're supposed to do it. It doesn't tell you how the data it, these operations work on are stored. All of that is contrasted with data structures. These are concrete implementations of an abstract data type, or maybe several abstract data types. Uh, and data structures do have to specify exactly how things are represented, what are the algorithms you use to implement the operations. And as a consequence, data structures have concrete performance. They have running time uh, for the operations. They have space cost. Whereas an, an abstract data type doesn't have that because it can be implemented in different ways. If you want an, an analogy from programming, then abstract data types are closest to something in Java called interfaces or abstract base classes in Python. So there is a notion of, of, uh, of this in Python, but I think it's one of the least used features in Python I know of. Uh, and I'm not even sure if this is taught in the intro to programming the fun programming fundamentals module. Uh, but it exists, so in, in case you're a Python expert, you can map it to that. Uh, if not, think of it as the description of a class with names of the functions, and that's it. No implementations. Everything is just pass. That's the closest I, I think I can, I can say. And well, for, for data structures, that's easier. It's just classes, usually. So. Um, Data structures are, in a way, quite conveniently mapped to object-oriented programming. You don't have to do it that way, but it's a very nice correspondence. Why do we bother about this? Uh, why don't we just do data structures? The code that runs at the end of the day always is data structures, because these guys, these abstract data types, they cannot run. There's no code. So why bother? Uh, the, it, it just turns out it's a good engineering principle to have a clean interface to say what you need and leave it to someone else to figure out how to best do it. And what best means can change. So you sometimes get statements in, in libraries, this is a drop-in replacement for a built-in uh, data structure for some, for some purpose. Uh, okay, I don't have a, a really brilliant example in mind now. Uh, it just means that you get reusable code. The code that uses a data structure doesn't need to know what the data structure is like as long as it only uses the abstract interface. So you can swap out the data structure and the, the client code that uses it can remain completely the same. That's really useful if you're writing big pieces of, of software. The only way we know to tackle complexity in software is to decouple things, have isolated units that you can swap out and understand in, in isolation. It also happens to have some knock-on effects. It just turns out to be useful to have names for certain abstractions so that you're not always talking in terms of bits and bytes and adding numbers on bits and bytes. Uh, people get better at uh, solving bigger problems if they have higher level abstractions to throw at it. Uh, and then the theory thing. If we have an abstract data type, we can sometimes prove that there's no, no implementation better than a certain lower bound. And we'll see some, some example of that. Uh, and there's, there's many, many more in, in the research literature. And here again, uh, the notion of an abstract data type really is, is fundamentally needed there. Otherwise, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know what, what all algorithms really means here. Good. Uh, that's a lot of advertisement. Uh, sometimes it's a bit like in, in this picture that you have a very, really nice interface and, and what's behind it is 
very rudimentary and sometimes it makes sense to break the interface up and look what is inside. So that's in a way the argument against building cars with the hood uh, sealed so that you can never open it. Uh, the same happens in programming. If, if everything is too closely knit, you sometimes overlook uh, uh, op opportunities. So say someone wanted to uh, water their plants, and so if they only see the interface, they have to carry this bowl around, fill it a hundred times, right? Whereas really the thing is just an interface for a hose that you could have pulled out, and that's, that's uh, why I put that picture. I found that, found that funny. Uh, and sometimes this happens in computer science. So ADTs are great, but be wary that you don't get too narrow in your thinking, only when it helps. All right, wake up time. Uh, again, no trick question. This is just uh, testing both. A, have you heard these words before? And B, have you internalized some of what I've just said? Uh, it's a long list. I think you need a minute. Okay, a few fast people are already in there. Let's try to get at least the, the 60 from before. Halfway. Few more. Almost there. All right. Uh, most got some votes. Uh, and they don't even fit on the screen. How small can we go before you can't read it anymore? Should be fine, right? My slides are probably smaller fonts. All right. So you can uh, you can check for yourself if you get those right. And uh, let me briefly run through these. So ADT is the name of the thing, right? Uh, stack and deck are ADTs. A linked list is a data structure. Same for binary search tree. Q is an ADT again. That's a data structure, that's a data structure, that's an ADT. Uh, okay, so basically all that are crossed out are data structures, concrete implementations of some of these. I think we'll talk about most of these in this unit with a few exceptions, so you'll, you'll fill the gaps if you had some. Let's talk about the first of these beasts, arguably the, the most simple one, uh, a stack. As the picture suggests, um, it could be a stack of books. And the problem with this kind of arrangement, also popular in, in my office occasionally, you can't really get conveniently at the books at the bottom. So in a stack, the operations that we support are listed here. We can get the topmost item without changing the stack. So just look at it. We can add a, no, a, more, a new item on top of it, so just put another book on top. We can pop, which means take the topmost item off, and it's gone from the stack. Uh, we can test if the stack is empty, and we create, can create new empty stacks. That's just for uh, making it a, a complete data structure, a complete, complete ADT. Uh, are there, is, is it clear what the operations are supposed to do? 
Now notice, I could explain this on a stack of books, just because it's a, a useful metaphor to remember this, but I, I haven't really said how the data is represented or how the operations are supposed to be realized in a computer. And there are different ways how to do that. Before we get to that, okay, this is almost, yeah. All right, let's do it. Uh, this Slido is so much fun. Um, this is a little question just to check if you, uh, if you understand the, uh, the operations correctly. Okay, so the stack looks like this. One is at the top, two, three, four, five. That's what it looks like initially. Okay, it seems um, so. So many people got this right instantly. So maybe, maybe it's, uh, it's as I hoped. Uh, the first pop removes the topmost. Then we're left with this. The second pop removes the topmost. So we're left with whatever's not crossed out. Uh, and then push adds another one on top. So we have the one, and the rest is the same. And now, well, my my way of writing this is uh, top down. So one, three, four, five, that's this one. And uh, that's what most of you found as well. Goody. Uh, well, maybe for the, to prove for the video, uh, almost all of you homed in on this one. So that's a stack. Great. We know what a stack is supposed to work like. How can we build a stack? The simplest, easiest way to build a stack is using a linked list. Now, if you already know what linked lists are like, you say, yeah, I've done, uh, clear. Uh, if not, let me try to briefly explain what it looks like. Um, the key idea is to use uh, a helper class that we use to represent data. So here, uh, I created a class node. So this, this, is, this is proper, it's all, almost Python code. Uh, I think the prior knowledge survey had pretty much this example as Python code with some things renamed to confuse you a bit. So we have a class node that has two uh, fields, so two instance variables, one value and a pointer to another object. And then the stack is, is realized um, by just a single pointer to the topmost element. Um, let me try to draw this a little bit. So I'll, I'll try uh, to have the two fields in the same order. So value first and then next below. And these kind of diagrams, uh, you, can, you can imagine I create a new object and it's just floating in, in space. So when I say a new object is created like in, in this line 10, we just get a new box that we can fill and that we can point to. So our stack, the representation of the stack itself is just a, a single variable top that points to some element. And I, I'll draw this like this. And then, uh, so that's, that's a legend. Let's put it here. So the initial stack was empty. The top was just pointing nowhere. That's a null pointer. Uh, say we had called push with a value 42. Then we would create a new node and put in the first field this value 42. And uh, we point, uh, we put in the second field whatever top pointed to before, which would have been null uh, initially. If we call this one more time, then, uh, I don't know, say uh, push 17. We would call this new node. Now top points to this. So uh, we have to, as next, we now get wherever top pointed to before. And then we rewire the pointer from top to point to this new element. 
that's one, uh, that's two, two, two executions of, of push. And you can imagine how pop would be, would be similar uh, if you just follow the code. You keep hold of where top pointed to before, and then you rewire your pointers. That way, the stack can grow and can shrink. Each element points to its neighbor below it in the, uh, in the stack. And that's all really you need to move up and down. Yep. Yeah, there, there should be is empty and, and create. So create we may not really need yeah. if you can just say new stack. Uh, empty is, yeah, empty is missing, but you can figure out how you would implement it here. Uh, I focused on the, on the more interesting operations. But there would also be an is empty. It's just uh, below the slide. <laughs> okay. Are we happy with this implementation? Uh, let's see how, how well it does. Uh, first of all, if we have n elements in the stack, it requires theta of n space because it requires one of these objects for each element on the stack. That's not that bad because uh, at least we don't require much more space than the number of elements we have. Uh, and what's really good, all operations are constant time because we just create a new element and rewire a, a single pointer and for, for pop as well. So these are all uh, constant time um, if the memory management is constant time. And that's as good as we can get. The only thing that's sometimes inconvenient is the same statement here is also a downside. Uh, we do have these extra pointers. For every element, we have one extra pointer, and we have to store that. So that's a bit, bit of wasted space. So if, if, if this uh, stack is growing really, really big, and maybe also if the elements we store are really small, it would be nice to get away from these extra pointers. Question? Now, if we don't want any pointers, the only thing we can really do is use an array. And uh, it's possible to use an array in this case. The idea here, I left out the detailed code. Uh, you can find this in, in, the, in the books I referenced. Uh, I, tried a, I wanted to have at least one example with concrete code on it to show you what, what the pseudocode looks like that I would use. It's quite close to Python uh, or other languages. And for those, I'll, I'll leave it with the conceptual idea. So uh, we can store one, one big array. Has all these, all these cells. And the other bit we need is uh, one, one index or one pointer into the array that tells us where's the topmost element so far. So if we have our, our array from before, five, four, three, two, one then top would point to this position. If we want to add another element, we write it in here and we rewire top to point one further, further up. If you want to pop an element, we just bring top one down. Uh, that's another easy way to do it. The operations are still constant time because we're just changing one pointer or one index and we can access the array uh, in constant time. We can jump to a specific position now, uh, the problem with that is arrays have fixed size. That's uh, the assumption from before. So what do we do if the array is full and we want another push? Then we're a bit in trouble. And with this simple implementation, you just have to live with it. It has fixed capacity. And so if you want another push, you're in an invalid state. And there are implementations like this that can just throw an exception in that case. So we need, at the time of creation of such an array-based stack, we need to fix the capacity. That's another annoying bit of it, though. Uh, we always reserve the space for the entire capacity, even if we only use up a little bit of it. So it's actually more wasteful in terms of space than the previous solution, unless we're at least half full or so. Uh, but the operations are probably even faster because we don't have memory allocation inside the operations. 
Now, of course, uh, the natural question is, can you get the best of both worlds? Can we have the fast access to the array and at the same time still be able to push as many elements as we like without running into this fixed capacity?